Well, good morning, almost afternoon. It's great to be with you, to be here, to uh, see so many of you again. This, the, the, I think the greatest treat for those of us as speakers, and, and probably I think I'm speaking for everybody, is the opportunity that we have to get together uh, the few times that we do each year. And uh, some, for some of us, it's once. For some of us, it might be once or twice. Uh, with that in mind, I would certainly like to encourage you to keep on your calendars, if you're available, the uh, Preterist Pilgrim Weekend in Ardmore, Oklahoma, that Don and the Preterist Research Institute are sponsoring and directing. Um, this year it will be a, an intense focus on resurrection, and I'm sure Don will have some more to say about that, but if you have any questions about it, Don can give you <clears throat> any information on that program. That will be in July, what? Uh, 17th through the 19th in Ardmore, and we would love, I know some of you already told me you're planning to be there, we would love to have you in attendance, uh, bring your air conditioning, um, it, 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 is, it is hot in Oklahoma in uh, July and things like that, but uh, we would love to see you there. Um, I did decide to change my topic, the topics that had been assigned to me or that I had chosen, Virgil doesn't assign, he kind of asks us what we'd like to talk on. I had chosen to talk on the, the worlds of 2 Peter 3, uh, not Matthew 24, by the way, but uh, the worlds of 2 Peter 3. I'm not changing because I think that's an unimportant topic or a non-important topic. I think it's critical and I think it's vital. And what I would also like to say to you, number one, I have, I have a 28-slide presentation on PowerPoint that I spent a long time putting together so that you, uh, hopefully you will know I, I did not do this frivolously. Uh, because I don't have a PowerPoint presentation for what I'm about to say. Um, if you're interested, I can probably email that to you in the future or something like that if you would like to see what it was, or you can wait till next year if I'm invited back after this. I might deliver it then, which would save myself a lot of work in the, uh, in the intervening months and time. But I would like to say this. If you want to understand the worlds of Second Peter 3 as Jack sees them, um, the material I was going to present was largely taken from a series that Tim King and I did back in 1997 and 98 with Presence Ministries entitled Covenant Eschatology, A Comprehensive Overview. And in that series, I did one of the four lessons that I did was on 2 Peter 3, the worlds of 2 Peter 3. And uh, that material was large, largely came, came from that, and I know many of you have that set. But what I would recommend for you to do in the intervening time, if you don't have that and you would like to look at it, I would encourage you to talk to Don and buy Don's new uh, updated work on 2 Peter 3, and it will tell you, I think, everything that you would like to know and study on the worlds of 2 Peter 3. So, Don, I will take 10% for any <laughs> book sales that come from that. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> you'd rather owe it to me and cheat me out of it, wouldn't you? I, that's what I, that's that's what I thought. <laughs> what I would like to talk about today is something that I think is critical. Um, I want to ask, what does the world need from the kingdom of God today? What do they need from us? This audience represents a fair sampling of what we would call the preterist world, the world of covenant eschatology, the world of fulfilled redemption or fulfilled eschatology. And by and large, when we look at our numbers, we are mature, <laughs> age-wise. There are some young faces here, younger faces, I should say. But we are a movement that is largely based upon those who are older, those who are very serious students of God's Word, none of which I find to this point fault with whatsoever. I'll turn 50 in July, so I are one. And I do believe that I am a serious student of God's Word, and I would never trade that for anything. But I also believe after a lot of years in this, and it's hard to say because I do think of myself as far younger than I really am, um, that I am one of the elder statesmen of this movement we call preterism or covenant eschatology. That doesn't mean I know more than the younger statesmen by any stretch of the imagination. But I have been around a long time. Many of us go back into the 80s, some even before that. Uh, Ed's been around longer than me. 
um, and, which means he's much older than I am. Uh, but anyway, we, we go back a long way when we began asking these questions. And we began a theological dialogue and a theological pursuit in understanding of answers. That pursuit will always go on, and I believe that it will always be relevant to what it is we are supposed to do. I have every confidence that the Bible is God's inspired word. And I do not want to seem in my presentation to disparage that notion. But of all people in the world, those who are assembled here should understand how much the truth of God's word has been affected by the traditions that we have been immersed in in our life. I'm reminded of the statement of Yaroslav Pelikan, who said, the church historian from Yale, who said uh, some time ago that tradition is the living faith of the dead. Traditionalism is the dead faith of the living. And I believe that that is exactly the case. And I believe what we have to do is we have to, in the spirit of what Virgil said this conference is really all about, about going back to the future, we've got to understand what the purpose of the kingdom of God is really for. We are a redemptive community. The purpose that God has for you and me, the church, the kingdom, the covenant family, however you would like to describe it, also is tied to the purposes of God for redeeming the world back to himself. Of all of the years that I have been involved in the pursuits of covenant eschatology and in the pursuit of knowledge, and I would describe myself still in that process, I recently presented a, uh, I'm presenting a series of lessons at the home congregation and church family that I'm part of in Ardmore, Oklahoma now. I have moved from Montana down to Ardmore, Oklahoma. Don has gone into full-time uh, ministry with Predators Research Institute, and I am now the minister for the uh, Ardmore church family there. I recently presented some ideas and concepts of things that, that, that we ought not to be fearful of. Number one, the truth has nothing to fear from the light of day. You and I know that and you and I believe it. Truth has nothing to fear from the light of day. I don't believe that we should hold anything so sacrosanct that we are not willing to courageously and fearlessly pursue a reexamination of it. It is not enough for me and never will be again that any group of people, any creedal document, any statement, any church of the past held something is true. That is not enough. What must be enough is a fearless pursuit of God's Word and an attempt to harmonize and see how all of the things that you and I hold dear are interrelated and they touch each other and they affect each other. I stepped into a room of dominoes stacked up in a beautiful design a long time ago, many years ago, and those dominoes started tipping and it hasn't ended. It hasn't ended for me, and I believe, in honesty, almost everyone here would say the same thing. We have not yet arrived at all truth. We have not yet arrived at the point that we are totally comfortable with where we are in the questions uh, already. Every place that I've gone so far, whether it was in the, in the restaurant or in the, in the hallways or out in the foyer, people were sitting asking what-if questions. Well, what if this is true, and how does that affect this? I mean, when people like Don or David Curtis or Terry Hall or Virgil or any of us are sitting there saying, well, what are the ramifications to this? It is long past time for uh, pontification and far, far more the time for an honest assessment of where we stand, what we know, and what we don't know. And the need to be really, really gracious and generous, as Virgis, Virgil has said, so many times as we approach each other in this study. I don't believe that we as a movement sometimes, and I believe I've been around long enough to make this assessment, and I don't do it with a critical heart. It may sound like it's critical. I don't do it with a critical heart. I do it with a hopeful spirit that we as a group have not learned much about polarization. We have come out of polarizing sects and polarizing denominations and backgrounds, and unless everybody marches in lockstep with all of our comfort zone positions and our traditional understandings, we have not always been kind to each other. That should not be. That should not be. The world needs something from us. The tragedy is 
I don't believe the world, when looking to us, really understand that we are the source that they will find it from. What they need from us and understanding that we are the only source that can give that to them are two different things. One of the things I believe we would all agree upon is that the kingdom of God, the, the family of God, the church, the community of God, the family, one family in heaven and on earth, Ephesians 3, 14 and 15, is that unique body and that unique institution into which God has infused his presence, Amen. his reality. It is described as the spiritual house, the tabernacle that is built together for him to live in throughout all ages, world without end or ages without end. And Paul would make very clear at the end of Ephesians chapter 3 after talking about that kingdom and talking about that spiritual family and that house that God has chosen. God has determined that His glory would be seen and understood in the world through that house, through that spiritual body of people. That's in wonderful agreement with the vision that Ezekiel had in Ezekiel chapter 37 when he talked about the concepts of resurrection and overcoming the power of the grave. At the end of that chapter, Ezekiel makes it clear God will tabernacle in the midst of His covenant people. They will literally be His tabernacle. And he said, the world will not know me through any other source or vehicle than that. The tragedy of our day and time. Not exclusively, not always. And if the things I say today do not apply to you, please do not take them personally. But the tragedy of our world today is I believe there are hosts of people hungry for, looking for, desiring for a relationship with God that do not see the church as having the answer. They see division they see cantankerous, ugly spirits. They see divi uh, uh, dissension. They see sectarianism. They see traditionalism that has really no basis in reality other than we've got to maintain a status quo. We've got to continue to do things, uh, sing songs a certain way, assemble in a certain way, never really challenging ourselves to know whether or not and even see whether or not how we're doing things is even really how the New Testament church did them. I don't believe that most of the forms, not all of which are wrong, the ways that we do things today, which are ways, not the way, even agree with what we see in spirit and in function in the New Testament in the early days. We who say, let's go back so that we can understand. What we see is a continuation of traditions or traditionalisms that we have become so comfortable with, we cannot even entertain the notion of doing away with them. Here is what the psalmist said, to me in spirit, the kingdom of God should be focused on. In Psalm chapter 84, verses 1 through 4, the psalmist writes this, How lovely is your tabernacle, O Lord of hosts! When the world looks at the church today, and let me get beyond the broad-based concepts of Christendom because that's just a little too much for even me or us to tackle today. There's a lot there. Let's just talk about the community of fulfilled redemption and fulfilled eschatology. Let's talk about the preterist community. Let's talk about the community of covenant eschatology. Whichever description you choose, let's talk about those of us who know we need to go back and set the Bible in its first century context or earlier. We need to go back and look at God's Word in the concept of the Hebrew mindset, of the Hebrew thought world that it was written in and lived out in exclusively. We understand all of those challenges, but do we really understand when the world looks at us, they need to see something totally different than what they've seen over the last several millennia, or the last two millennia at least, in the name of Christianity. And in the last couple of generations in particular, as Christianity in the world that you and I have lived in has fragmented and fractured and presented such a confusing picture, it's no wonder that people feel disenfranchised from it. How lovely is your tabernacle, O Lord of hosts! My soul longs, yes, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home and the swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young. Even your altars, O Lord of hosts, 
my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They will still be praising you. There's two things that are abundantly clear in that context. The house of God is the place of peace. It is the place of fulfillment. It is the place of relationship with God. It is a place that all of God's people should hunger for. The second is, it is the place where God's presence and glory is manifested to a world that needs to see it. What does the world see when they look at you and me? When all they see in the preterist movement at times is intramural debate and ugliness and divisiveness. Not all the time. Many times there's wonderful discussion. How can we really believe that those of us who have come from so many backgrounds, so many different perspectives, are really going to be able to sit down and say all the same things about all the same issues and subjects at all the same time? It's not going to happen. Never will. Not as long as I'm alive. It might happen afterwards, I guess, but I really kind of doubt it. And I'm not sure that's what God had in mind. Conformity, uniformitarianism, religiously and thought-wise, is not what God had in mind. But He did have in mind a world of peace, a world so committed to God in loving relationship, a community, a covenant community, so, so committed to Him and committed to one another that it literally transforms the way the world looks at that community of people. Topping any list of what the world needs from the church of what the world needs from the kingdom, and let me say, primarily, what the world needs from the community of preterism. A fulfilled eschatology is hope. They need hope. Leroy Douglas said, hope is one of those things in life you simply cannot do without. Dr. Bernie Siegel said, refusal to hope is nothing more than a decision to die. And in the truest spirit of ecumenical (laughs) one-anotherness, let me quote Hal Lindsey. (laughs) No rocks, please. (laughs) Hal Lindsey said something that I can agree with. (laughs) And that is, man can live about 40 days without food, three days without water, about eight minutes without air, but only for one second without hope. What a powerful concept. What does the world hope for? (laughs) I truly do believe. And this is one thing that our younger Christians and the younger younger generation of Christians are asking us to think about. I do not believe it is true at all when people begin assessing the generations coming up or presently the unchurched as saying they have no interest in God. I think that's bunk. I believe they have a hunger for God. They just don't have a hunger for a God that is contained in the boxes of our traditionalism. They don't have the hunger for a God that agrees with our sensitivities culturally, religiously, societally. I think we have a much healthier dialogue going on. And I think the Internet, I think preterism is largely responsible for a lot of this. I think our efforts to get people to think perhaps will be a double-edged sword even for us at times. What happens when their freedom that we are encouraging them to embrace, to think, to study, what happens with their access on the Internet when the Bible literally is no longer chained to the pulpit for the first time really historically? What happens when they use that and they begin questioning us in the ideas and the comfort zones that we have considered so sacrosanct, so holy as to not be challenged or thought about? What do we do? Do we, in the Spirit of God who lovingly embraces us in all of our differences and all of our weaknesses and every manifestation of the inadequacy of our humanity, do we embrace them in the same spirit or do we say, get in step or get out? The world has, I believe, a hunger for God that is historically among the most healthy that we have known in the last 2,000 years. 
But if they're not beating the doors down to our church buildings, it's not because they're not hungry. It's because they don't see or hear or smell anything that looks like the breath of fresh air that Christianity was to bring to the world. We need of all people to see what God has called us to do and to agree, even with Hal Lindsey, <laughs> that those who have no hope, mark it down, <laughs> those who have no hope will die. What does the world need hope for? I'd like to suggest three things, and I'm following this up tomorrow with some other things as well of what the world needs from the church. But today, I'd like to just talk about hope. Number one, they need the hope for forgiveness. The hope for forgiveness. One of the most moving stories to me, and if you really want to quote Jack, Jack Scott believes the most powerful evangelistic text in the Bible is Matthew chapter 9, verses 9 and following, or Luke's account would be in Luke chapter 5, verses 27 to 32. What? What? Not Matthew 28, not Mark 16, not Luke 24, not Acts chapter 2. That, that, that used to be. I was in the Church of Christ, so Acts chapter 2 had to be it. But no, I don't believe. Matthew chapter 9 in the call of Matthew as one of the apostles of our Lord, I believe is the most powerful evangelistic text in the Bible. <laughs> Think with me, if you would, to the time when Jesus calls Matthew. He comes into the town square where Matthew is sitting as a tax gatherer. Matthew has a lucrative business. It's not one with many friends. And it's one that we're overly sensitive about right now this time of year. <laughs> but Matthew has a lucrative business. He has a lucrative career. He has success. He has material things and blessings, and he also has an ear for this thing he's heard about, this, this person he's heard about, this, this message he's heard about, encapsulated in the form of a man named Jesus Christ. And it has his attention. Matthew has a hunger for God, but he doesn't have a hunger for God based upon the traditionalism of the Pharisees or the Sadducees or the Essenes or any other sect or any other group of Judaism. He has grown comfortable with selling out his people, quote unquote, becoming a hireling for the nation of Rome because he sees nothing in Judaism that really appeals to him other than the concept of God. And Jesus comes to where Matthew is and he's gathering people and people are gathering around him in hordes. And I tell people when I teach this text, you really have to put your imagination caps on. You have to sit behind the tax collecting table with Matthew and you have to imagine what's going on in his mind. Here is a man who has a hunger for God but is disenfranchised by religion. He is disenfranchised by traditionalism. But he has a hunger for God. How do I know that? Because ultimately when Jesus looks at him and calls him, he follows. He gets up and follows. But here's a man also that looks at Jesus saying, are you really different? Is this form of faith, is this form of theology that you espouse, that you live, is it really different from anything that I've seen, from anything that I've experienced before? Surely when you look around the town square and you're looking for disciples, you'll look at me and look right past me. Because I am a publican, a tax gatherer, a sellout, a traitor to my people. And no sooner, you know it and I know it, no sooner had Matthew gone through all of that in his mind than he looked up and the eyes of Jesus were on him. And Jesus looked at him and he said, follow me. And it wasn't just a, hey, you want to go to lunch? Put your sign out. We'll be back in an hour. You can make a decision at that point. It was a look that called him to make a choice and he knew it. And he got up and he walked away. He walked away from everything. He walked away from the table. He walked away from a career. He walked away from profiteering. He walked away from a comfortable lifestyle. And he walked into the unknown with the exception that he saw and heard and smelled and experienced the God of heaven and earth in the man of Jesus Christ and those who walked with him. And an amazing thing takes place. He goes to his house and he eats with him and the next thing we read, this is why it is the most powerful evangelistic text in the Bible, sinners and tax gatherers came to him. It is not any different today. The world is filled with broken lives. Broken, wrecked, ruined lives. 
lives that have experienced so much of the absence of God, there is nothing but confusion in its place. And if we think for a moment the world is not filled with people wanting another solution, willing to walk away from everything, just as Matthew did, then we are deluded. What the world isn't seeing is a model of the fragrance of God in the concepts of Christianity that they hear and see. They need more, quite frankly and quite honestly. And so do we. So do we. In Luke chapter 7, another account of the same type of impact. In Luke chapter 7, we see the story of a, a young woman. John would tell us later on that this is Mary, the sister of Martha, whose brother is Lazarus. But this woman comes to Jesus. Jesus is in the home of a certain Pharisee named Simon. He comes to the home. Simon invites him. He wants to know more about Jesus. But what Simon really wants to know is, will Jesus accommodate the comfort zones of his faith? Will Jesus preach a system of theology? Will Jesus share a God and live a God that's consistent with what he has expected the Messiah to be? He wasn't asking for Jesus to show him how he could change his life. He wanted to know if Jesus would conform to his sensitivities, religiously, societally, culturally. And in the meeting of these intense differences, a woman comes in and begins crying and with tears washing the feet of Jesus Christ taking her hair and drying his feet, kissing his feet, anointing him with oil. And all Simon can say is, if the Lord knew what kind of woman this was, he wouldn't let her touch him. All Simon could think is, this woman is religiously unpure. She needs to go through all of these religious ceremonies and purificational rituals and all of these things. And then once she's demonstrated that willingness and that capability, then maybe she's worthy of our presence. Then maybe she's worthy of our fellowship. Then maybe she's worthy of our synagogue or of our church, whatever it might be. I don't need to tell anybody here that far too often every tradition probably represented here has lived that kind of relationship with the world. But Jesus confronts him and says, Simon, you gave me no water for my feet. You gave me no oil for my head, but this woman has not ceased washing my feet with her tears, drying it with her hair, anointing me with oil. And then he asked him, let me tell you a story about two people that owed a money to a creditor. One owed a little amount, one owed a great big amount. He forgave them both because neither had the ability to pay. Which one loved him more? And of course he said, well, I suppose the one that owed the greater amount. And of course Jesus looks at her and says, her sins, though many, are forgiven. The world is looking to us for hope. Hope for forgiveness. To quote that great American satirist and theologian Mark Twain, he said, Lord, save us all from a hope tree that has lost the faculty of putting out blossoms. We're the hope tree. Right. Have we lost the ability to put out blossoms? Have we lost the ability to communicate to a world that we are a redemptive community and embracing community? Not a community of intramural spats and fights, but a community that embraces all of our needs, all of our questions, the things we share in common, and embraces a respectful and understanding and wonderful dialogue in the things that we do not. Because God's kingdom is bigger than any of us. It's bigger than all of us. And it has the ability to transform society and culture and the world if we'll give it the chance. Hope for forgiveness. Secondly, hope for understanding. How many of us have forgotten that there is no temptation that has overtaken you but such as is common to man? 1 Corinthians 10. How many of us have gained such a wonderful ability to look over, overlook, pass over if you will, all of our weaknesses and idiosyncrasies, all of the, the foils and the, and the, the, or the foibles and the, the fallacies and the tendencies and the, uh, all of those things of our humanity and just understand and embrace the notion, well, surely God in His grace embraces us, but we look at each other and we say, your differences are different. We're all in the same boat. 
Jesus used the story of the Pharisee and the tax collector, who, both of whom had come to the temple to pray. And the Pharisee, standing up proudly, looking into heaven, says, Thank you, God, for making me right. Thank you, God, for giving me the truth. Thank you, God, that I am not like other men. The kingdom of God today, as we go back so that we can understand what the future is to be, what do they see? Which model of man do they see when they look at our fellowships? When they see the buildings that we meet in or the homes or the Bible studies or the systems, when they see online the communication styles, the, the blogs, the posts, the discussion forums, the articles, what do they see when they look at you and me? What do they hear? Do they hear the Pharisee, thank you for giving us all things, not making us like these other people? Or do they see the tax gatherer who smote his chest and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner? Do they sense the humility that comes only from the awareness that you and I have come out of traditions 2,000 years old that are wrong? Who should be more humble? Those of us who recognize that God is far larger than the boxes we have kept Him in. Or a world that doesn't see that. What the world really needs is the hope of seeing covenant communities of faith that will give God the chance to be God. And not strap Him with our baggage and our limitations. When the guilt of sin presses, I think most of us know today people don't want judgment. They've already judged themselves. They know. Your average human being elsewhere, they're, they're everywhere. There might be a couple of exceptions, but your average human being knows what they've done wrong. I believe God did a really good job when He instilled the conscience. I believe no, most of us know when we're doing wrong. I believe most of us understand how terribly and tragically short we fall from what God wants of us. We've already judged ourselves. The reason I serve God today is because of that one promise, the one that keeps me going more than all others, that He will not remember my sins and iniquities against me. Now, that's just too good to be true, but that's what makes it the gospel. It's true. And I embrace it. And I can allow God to be God because I don't know anybody that knows my weaknesses that will not remember them against me. And when I look in the remember, mirror, I remember every one of them. I remember every one. So when I look at me and I see such limitation, even in the grace that I can extend to myself, I do not even have the ability to extend to myself the grace that I need. I have to have a God that has the ability to extend grace beyond what I'm capable of. That's right. How importantly you and I need to remember that when we deal with each other, when we judge each other, when we evaluate each other, when we ask the world to confront their traditionalism, when we ask our brothers and sisters who embrace faith in God from whatever tradition they come from, asking them to consider whether or not the things they have held eschatologically, redemptively, theologically, and use a whole bunch of flashy terms, whether or not they've been right about those things. When did the time come for us to stop doing that? I don't believe it ever has. The church historian Martin Marty said, even the cry from the depths is an affirmation. Why cry if there is no hint of hope of hearing? Do you hear the cries today? When you live in the world and you work among your friends and neighbors and family, don't you hear the cries? I do. I'm getting more sensitive to them all the time and it's becoming so loud it's deafening. We've got to step out of 20 years or more of debates about Matthew 24 or any other little idea or agenda that we have or sensitivity that we have and recognize it's time for God 
to empower us to be the kingdom he desires for us to be. It's time for us to be the bridge God intends for us to be to the world. We're great fort builders. We can dig moats so deep and put alligators so big in those moats. We are remarkably gifted at it. But we very seldom let the drawbridge even down, let alone tear down the forts and just be bridge builders. You see, what we have is a wonderful place called the kingdom of God. And God wants a bridge wide, long, beautiful, significant to the world to come into that place. They want to know out there, is there loving empathy? Is there understanding in the family of God? When we look at them, do we look at them as Jesus looked at Matthew? Not as a turncoat, not as a traitor, not as a broken, fallen person, but as a world of potential if we'll just let them confront God and God confront them. Truth has nothing to fear from the light of day. The second point I shared with our congregation is there is nothing to fear by delivering anybody before the throne of God and to allow God to do what He wants to do with them. To allow God to confront them where they live, the questions they have, the traditions they've come out of, and to bring them along and develop them. Who of us has the right to step in and say, that's as far as God goes with you? I don't think we do. Hope for forgiveness. Hope for understanding. Thirdly, hope for another chance. We serve a God of second chances, of second chances, of second chances, of second chances. One of the most touching texts in the Bible to me is John chapter 21. Because in John chapter 21, Peter goes through what I call a post-conversion conversion. And I think most of us go through it. Not strictly, not theologically. But in John chapter 21, just before the ascension of Christ, in that 40-day period when Jesus, after His resurrection, is appearing to His disciples one by one and in groups of 500 at times, and at various times trying to get them to understand what the identity and the makeup of the kingdom is really all about. It wasn't about their predispositions and presuppositions. It wasn't about their comfort zones. It wasn't about the traditionalism of whatever sect they came up in in Judaism. It is about God's vision for redeeming and purchasing the world back to Himself. And that's so much bigger than any and all of the traditions put together in this room can ever amass to. And Peter knows he's missed it. A few days earlier, he had boldly said, the rest may deny you, but I won't. Jesus said, you'll do it three times before the rooster crows. And in Luke's account, when Peter is swearing and using the Lord's name in vain and cursing the name of the Lord Jesus, the third time he looks and he is in proximity where Jesus is and Jesus has heard every word. And Luke tells us that he looked at him. You ever read that text and wondered what kind of look Jesus gave? I can just about guarantee it isn't the one I would have given him. <laughs> I come from a little logging and mining town in Northern California and a family that was far too physical and we didn't mind busting each other up. We didn't mind a good Saturday night brawl. If there was everybody, ever anybody that needed a whooping, it was Peter from that world and that way of thinking. But you know as well as I do, when Peter looked into the eyes of Jesus, he saw love. He saw forgiveness and he saw the Lord saying, it's okay, let it go. I'll talk to you about it shortly. And in John chapter 21, he talks to him about it again. Jesus says, I'm going fishing. <laughs> he wasn't recreationally going fishing, like some of us like to or going hunting. He was going back to the Sea of Galilee where he first met the Lord. When Jesus came and said, you fished all night, caught any fish? No, put your net on the other side of the boat. We all know the story. What does Peter do? He falls down on his face and says, Lord, forgive me, I am a, or depart from me, I am a sinful man. I cannot handle your presence. It's too righteous. It's too holy. It's too embracing. It's too forgiving. All I see is my smallness in its midst. Peter missed something. He left something important in the boat. So he goes back. If there had ever been a fishing exposition where people prayed all night that they would not catch fish again, it was this one. The disciples go with him and they fish all night. And at daylight they see a man walking on the beach. Is it the Lord? Tell me, have you caught anything? 
No, we fished all night. Put your net on the other side of the boat. No lip this time, no debate, no, no quarrels. They throw the net on the other side of the boat. They start pulling in such a load, it says that they were sinking the boat. Peter doesn't care about the fish. Peter does something that I call divine madness. He reaches down, puts on his outer cloak. I don't know if you've ever tried to swim with a lot of clothes on. I had to do it in Marine Corps boot camp. It wasn't fun. He puts on his outer cloak and he jumps into the sea. Peter isn't leaving anything in the boat this time. He wants to know what he missed. He wants to know how to embrace God in a realistic way. And he comes to the shore just about the same time the disciples get there rowing. Peter's just wetter. He says, what have you found? And of course they look and there's the fire prepared. There's the fish already cooked. The Lord's showing he is still providing what we can never do on our own. Call that knowledge, call that skill, call that anything you want. Jesus came to provide what we could not do on our own. How can we who understand that deny it to others? And then begins that painful confrontation. Peter, as they sit around the fire eating, he isolates Peter. Do you love me? Do you agape me? Do you have that self-sacrificing, ultimate giving kind of love for me, Peter? Peter's not quite the braggadocious sort he was 40 days earlier or so. He says, Lord, you know that I phileo you. I have a brotherly kind of affection for you. Jesus doesn't do a WWE smackdown. He doesn't say, that's not good enough. I've died for you. What do you, you know, I, I mean, let's, 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 let's really get real here. Peter, it's time for you to grow up. It's time for you to break. He doesn't do that. He looks at him. He says, okay, feed my sheep. A little pause there for a while. Peter begins to perspire. Not from the fire, but from the intensity of the moment. And he says, Peter, do you agape me? I'm squirming thinking about how Peter was squirming. And I don't think Peter is the only one squirming. I think all of the rest of them know this is a confrontation with him as well. And he says, Lord, you know I have a brotherly affection for you. I'm not going to be bold and brag about what I am anymore or what I can do. He looks at him, he smiles, and he says, feed my sheep. Now you also know, as do I. Peter's sweat became, as it were, probably great drops of blood. As he sat there thinking, Lord, I will do anything if you'll not ask me a third time. No sooner does it come to his mind and Jesus says, Peter. And then he changes and accommodates Peter's word. He says, do you phileo me? Do you have a brotherly affection for me? And Peter in anguish cries out and says, Lord, you know all things. You know my brokenness, you know my humanity, you know my fallenness, you know that I am nothing that I ever thought I was. You know I can't even hold a conversation with you and be sure about what I'm telling you. But Lord, you also know that I, I see no other solution than you. I see no other hope. Jesus doesn't say, sorry, Peter, that's not enough. He says, feed my lambs. That is enough. Peter, feed my lambs. Paul said, I was formerly a blasphemer, an insolent man. But by God's grace... God's grace, I am redeemed. An anonymous author that I read said, Hope is grief's best music. Charles Allen wrote, When you say a situation or person is hopeless, you are slamming the door in the face of God. And Adam Cowley stated, Hope of all the ills that men endure is the only cheap and universal cure. And I don't mean cheap in the sense of what it costs to provide it. I mean cheap in the sense, as Tim just pointed out so eloquently in his last lecture, is free. God lovingly, freely offers it. Hope sees the invisible. This is really what I'm talking about. It sees the invisible. It feels the intangible. And achieves the impossible. That's the house God wants to live in with you and me. Let's think about that as we think about how we love each other.
how we treat each other, and how we share this thing we call the gospel of the kingdom of our God. Thank you.